This podcast is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as such. You should always obtain legal advice about your specific circumstances. Hello and welcome to our newest season of Tax Records. Uh, I'm Frank Inoperis, uh, a partner in the tax section and also the, uh, the head of the tax team at Hall & Wilcox. And um, we are delighted to bring our uh, listeners yet another season of Tax Records. Uh, it has been one of our favourite um, products to, uh, to produce and uh, we've really loved the engagement we've been able to have with lots of our uh, clients and regular listeners. And um, I'm uh, particularly excited today uh, to be presenting uh, with James Bull the first instalment of our um, of our twin pair of M and A tax and commercial focus podcasts. Um, our discussion with James is going to be split into uh, two chapters. Uh, in chapter one, we'll be talking about uh, the M and A process and how it starts uh, through to the point of uh, the completion of due diligence. Uh, in the second chapter, uh, we'll be talking about um, the uh, what, we, what we can expect to happen uh, from the point at which we start drafting and negotiating a sale agreement uh, through to the point of completion. A quick introduction to James. Uh, James is a special counsel in our uh, corporate and commercial team. He has uh, lots of experience in M&A transactions with a particular focus on both the private market and private equity um, focused transactions and um, a special focus on the technology sector. And um, James is also uh, one of the uh, founders and drivers of Hall & Wilcox's Frank program. Uh, and that's a, a startup incubator uh, that Hall & Wilcox formed uh, some years ago. And um, we have now had a number of cohorts of um, startup businesses come through that program and uh, under James's uh, guidance together with the rest of the corporate and commercial team we have had uh, tremendous traction and tremendous success with that uh, with that program so James uh, let's start with uh, chapter one of our discussion today thanks Frank great to be here Excellent. Um, so, James, what we're here to do today is to talk about the M&A process and really for our, our listeners, and, and we can expect a lot of our listeners will be um, accountants or financial advisors or other people involved in helping uh, guide clients through uh, some of the key uh, business transactions that they might be experiencing um, over the course of their, their, their business cycle and their business journey. And um, we, you and I, and, and at Holland Wilcox, we, we see this a lot. Um, an accountant or an advisor uh, may have a client. Um, they will have built their business up uh, over a number of years. Um, they've uh, now got an offer uh, from somebody to, uh, to purchase that business from them. It could be unsolicited and come out of the blue, or it could be uh, uh, the result of a carefully managed uh, process to, from them to try and exit their business. Um, the other scenario that we would have is that you might have a client who is looking to scale up their business and um, take it really to the next level. Uh, they might look to explore uh, new markets uh, or they may look to swallow up a, a competitor. And um, by doing that, by, by bolting on another business, uh, that might be a way of fast tracking uh, those sort of ambitions. Um, but in either case, what we have is a, a potential M&A sale process. So what I'd like for us to talk about today is, you know, what does this look like and um, what happens next? You know, what is the usual process for an M&A transaction? And um, just to get a bit of a, a sense and an overview from you about the steps that might be involved in uh, buying or selling a business. And importantly, I think for our listeners, um, just trying to demystify and explain uh, some of the usual jargon, uh, and as lawyers, we love a bit of jargon, but just to demystify and explain some of the jar jargon that um, that often uh, you hear about um, with these uh, kind of transactions. So um, after that long introduction, James, uh, maybe the best place for us to start um, is for those who haven't been involved in buying or selling a business before, tell us a little bit about what that process would typically involve. Thanks, Frank. The process uh, will differ a little bit from deal to deal, but at the same time, there's a pretty well-worn path for buying or selling a business. Um, 
it, it will often start with signing a term sheet or a heads of agreement, uh, followed by some, some due diligence by the buyer, preparing and negotiating a, a sale agreement and the other key transaction documents, then signing and signing those documents and completion. But before we dive into that, there's probably a step that unless you've gone through this process before, it's it's easy to skip over. And that's really just preparation. Um, and on the sell side, you know, it's particularly critical. It's often called getting your house in order, um, tidying up your contracts, extending any that have expired, making sure your key trademarks are registered, that the ASIC record reflects your share structure. Um, on the financial side, making sure your accounts are in good order, that any related party transactions that can be cleaned up are, um, and also just um, starting to populate a data room, putting all of your key documents in the one place. So, that, you know, in ideally in logical folders. Um, and all of these things will ultimately make uh, any sale process when you find the right buyer much smoother and it will also reduce the chance of a buyer getting spooked when they do finally arrive. Um, so yeah, it's very much a case of first impressions matter and if if the buyer opens up the hood and everything looks in good, or, good order, they may not dig around as much. Um, okay, James, so that's um, an explanation of the preparation that you should do um, if you're looking to to sell your business. Um, what if you're on the other side and what if you're the buyer? Yeah, so a um, bit of a different process and, and things to think about on the buy side. Um, you need to think about the uh, sell side or buy side, you need to think about the structure for the potential acquisition. Um, will it make more sense to buy the shares or the assets? Um, at a high level, acquiring shares is typically a more straightforward process in terms of the mechanics. But at the same time, you're taking on all of the target company's liabilities, whether that's tax liabilities or customer or employee claims. Um, so that all needs to be weighed up. Um, and also as a buyer, you, know, you, you, know, you need to think about how are you going to pay for what you're buying? Do you need finance? If so, start looking at that. So really just thinking about what lies ahead and getting prepared. Um, that, that's that's what we're talking about, sell side and buy side. All right, James. So one of the first things that you mentioned there was uh, a heads of agreement or uh, an MOU, or uh, in my, maybe there are other ways of describing that as well. So can we talk about that a little bit? Um, because it usually uh, is one of the first things that um, a buyer and a seller um, will uh, will formally do to kick off the transaction. So um, can we talk a little bit about uh, about those concepts? Yeah, so whether you call it a heads of agreement, uh, a term sheet, letter of intent, MOU, um, it's got <laughs> many names, but really what it is, is a succinct document that sets out or aims to set out the key commercial terms for the transaction. And while these documents, uh, they're, yeah, they're typically expressed to be non-binding, except for a few key terms, which will generally be exclusivity and confidentiality. And really uh, what these documents do is they form a basis for negotiating uh, the transaction in the full form agreements. So you mentioned um, exclusivity and confidentiality. Could we just tell our audience um, what that means and, and what it what it's exclusivity and confidentiality in? Yeah. So Exclusivity, um, if, if you're a, um, a, a willing seller of a business, you may have multiple potential buyers. And um, what exclusivity does is um, on both sides for buyer and seller, it, it means that they can only deal with the one party. So the seller can only deal with that buyer, um, not a, another potential buyer. And it gives the parties a period of time um, often you might lock in exclusivity for 90 days or 120 days where they can enter into good faith negotiations and try and get the thing done without the distractions of other parties bobbing up and saying, oh, I'll give you, you know, 5% more. Excellent. And, and uh, confidentiality uh, is also very important, particularly as a seller. Um, you always need to be aware of 
potentially ad, uh, adverse motivations of buyers. So <laughs> sometimes you'll get a buyer that might be a competitor and instead of um, having a genuine interest in acquiring your business, they might be looking to get some pricing information or other sensitive information um, through pretending to be interested in buying your business. So as a seller, you should always think about, is there any information that's particularly sensitive or confidential that you might want to hold back and until a little further down the track? And that's often called um, black box information. So um, yeah, confidentiality, really important, um, particularly for a seller to, to lock that in in the term sheet. Excellent, James. And and you said that these documents are typically succinct. Now, we're, we're lawyers, so uh, succinct could mean 25 pages, but um, how long are these uh, term sheets or heads of agreement typically? Fortunately, I've never seen a term sheet um, as long as 25 pages. Um, I'm sure they exist. Um, typically, what we see is kind of three to six pages of really the, the key terms um, compared to the sale agreement, which, can, as you know, can be much longer. <laughs> we, we, we do indeed. And, uh, and, and of course, heads of agreements can, um, can raise some important issues from a tax point of view, um, and in particularly around the time of contract. That's one of the things we'll be exploring in the next part of our uh, M&A podcast series. Okay, James, so we've got our term sheet signed now. Uh, what happens next? If it hasn't already commenced, the next phase will generally be buyer due diligence. Um, and that will often kick off with the buyer preparing a due diligence questionnaire, often called a, a RFI or request for information. And this document is basically um, a list of, of questions that the buyer wants answered and that will help guide their due diligence and fill any gaps that might be in the data room. Typically these days, the data room will be an electronic data room and it's uh, basically just a electronic means of collecting all of the key documents relating to your company and your business and ordering them ideally in an easily findable and reviewable set of folders. So uh, when a buyer uh, kicks off a due diligence, uh, what is that likely to cover? What are they going to be looking at? Yeah, so it will typically cover financial, uh, legal, tax, commercial, and um, often some other technical aspects relating to the business, depending on what uh, the business does and what industry it's in. Uh, legal due diligence will cover things like corporate structure, uh, material contracts with customers and suppliers, IP, employment issues, financing arrangements, um, property and, and you know any other key risk areas of the business. So uh, ideally, it's, uh, it's pretty broad and covers all of the key risk areas relating to the business. One of the things uh, that we often confront um, when somebody's buying a, a shares in a business especially is a change of control clause. Uh, that tends to get people a little bit anxious. So can we just explain uh, what, what that means and what we need to look out for? Yeah, change of control clauses are really important. And again, um, some more jargon for the listeners. Um, a change of control basically just means a particular clause in an agreement, whether it's a customer contract or a lease or a, or a facility agreement, which allows the third party, the bank or the landlord, whatever they are, to uh, terminate that agreement upon a change of control. So upon um, the transfer of um, generally a majority of the shares in the company. So it's important that uh, a buyer determines whether which contracts have those clauses in them and uh, allow that the parties allow enough time to approach those parties at the appropriate time in the transaction and get their consent to the change of control. Because uh, if you don't, you're um, potentially in breach of that contract and would allow the third party to terminate it. I, I think that's an important point, James, because from a practical point of view, those are things where uh, the timing can be controlled uh, by third parties. And um, and if, if you don't get ahead of those third party consent uh, types of issues, uh, then you can find, um, find your transaction uh, significantly delayed. So it's important to call that out uh, for, our, for our listeners. And the other thing that we see a lot in, in transactions like this is um, 
whether it's in uh, as part of the due diligence process after they've been identified, but um, a requirement that certain key contracts be assigned. So can we talk about what an assignment means in this particular context? Yeah, so um, where change of control clauses are relevant when you're buying shares, assignment clauses are relevant when you're buying assets and you need to assign uh, particular contracts uh, to, to the buyer. So again, you need to go through all of the, of the key contracts, the business that you're buying, um, financing arrangements, leases, customer contracts, figure out where the assignment clauses are and um, draw up generally a, a pretty simple deed of assignment, which requires, again, um, the consent and cooperation of that third party to make sure that uh, coming in as a buyer, you've got all of those contracts signed up when you take over the business. Excellent. Um, so we, we talked about due diligence and, and that that may have a legal, financial, tax, uh, employment um, component to it. Uh, and we talked a little bit about um, some of the key legal due diligence issues. Um, I don't think we have enough time to talk about each one of those things one by one. But, um, but once due diligence is, is done or completed, um, what's the sort of outcome of that? What, what is produced and, and, and what happens? Uh, what, what do people do with that? Yeah, really good question. So uh, uh, traditionally, uh, lawyers, um, uh, financial advisors, tax advisors, whoever's doing the due diligence would typically prepare a due diligence report where they um, highlight all of the, uh, the most material risks of what they've looked at and make some recommendations as to how those risks can be mitigated in the sale agreement and other transaction documents. Um, Back in the day, those due diligence reports um, could be pretty long. Um, I remember preparing a few in my early days, which were well um, north of 100 pages. Um, these days, we would typically be asked only to identify material risks. Um, it's often called a red flag due diligence report, and um, it, it would generally be a lot shorter than that. And I think that kind of trend is is similar um, for financial and tax advisors as well mm. on their reports. Yeah, uh, well, I think we both know clients definitely like shorter documents and longer ones, don't they, James? But um, so that's right. And just to round out this discussion about the sort of this is before you're in the real kind of hard negotiating of the terms of the agreement, but just just to round out what happens at this part of the process. We talked about third party consents and how they can be a source of, of delay because um, the timing of those is not controlled by the client, it's controlled by third parties. Can we talk about some of the other things that we should um, uh, call out or, or, or flag that may cause um, some of the timing or the party's you know, intended timing or, or sort of program to blow out? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point um, because the earlier you identify those things, the earlier you can start solving for them. There's, there's probably two, two parts. The first thing is any really significant risks that have been identified during due diligence um, between the advisors and the client need to determine how you're going to protect against those risks and um, it might be through the inclusion of a specific indemnity in the contract, and you should put that in front of the seller sooner to, sooner rather than later, or it might be through trying to fix the issue. So, you know, if there's some um, tax that's outstanding, which would otherwise require an indemnity um, in the sale agreement, perhaps the tax can be paid um, and that would um, solve that issue or the particular um, problem can be fixed. Uh, the other thing is uh, similar to um, third party approvals with you know landlords and banks who can take a long time. Um, regulatory approvals are another thing that can take a long time. So certain transactions will require approval from um, FERB, the Foreign Investment Review Board, um, and other transactions might require the approval of the ACCC because they give rise to potentially um, anti-competitive conduct and again sooner rather than later the parties need to determine whether any of those approvals might be might need to be obtained um, and if so um, start preparing the relevant documentation and seeking the approvals because um, neither of those processes are quick 
Um, aside from FERB and ACCC, um, for transactions in certain sectors, um, whether it be healthcare or financial services or broadcasting, um, there might be specific approvals um, that relate to that particular industry. So again, it's really important that you've got the right advisors that really understand your business um, and understand what approvals are required to do the transaction. Excellent. Um, so I think a couple of messages there uh, are, if you are preparing uh, for a sale, um, then make sure you have um, an awareness and you've checked out uh, whether you have any key contracts that will require a third party's consent um, before they can be uh, dealt with. And also see whether or not um, you would need any special regulatory or other approvals uh, that would have to be uh, given or processed by a third party um, that uh, uh, need to be managed before there can be a transfer um, of your business. And, and just uh, the final question to round out this part about due diligence. Um, so you explained that this due diligence process is really driven by the buyer because they're the ones who um, are taking the risk and, and, and want to really check out the business thoroughly. Um, uh, what does a seller usually do uh, in the due diligence process? What's their role? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the role of the sellers and, and their advisors is certainly not quite as involved um, in the due diligence process, but it's it's still very important. And it's basically uh, for, for advisors um, holding the hand of your client through the process, helping them respond to the due diligence questionnaire and um, any other requests for information in an, in a sensible manner and, um, and accurately um, thinking about whether the buyer is asking for information that's particularly sensitive or confidential and should be held back uh, until a little further into the process in case the, you know, the buyer loses interest and um, they're then um, in possession of that information. Also, just keeping your client calm because some sellers can get frustrated because the due diligence process feels a little endless. They feel like they've already answered questions or um, given information, but we find that the best thing to do is to just um, calmly provide the information that's been requested, provided it's reasonable and keep the process going. Um, and generally that will lead to um, the most painless um, due diligence process. Couldn't agree with you more, James, that in a, in a, in a, in a, in a matter like this or in a process like this, um, managing the client's emotions is uh, is very, very important. Um, so thanks very much for that, James. We've really appreciated uh, you uh, sharing your expertise uh, and your thoughts with us on this podcast. Um, uh, thank you to uh, our audience for listening in on this um, first uh, in our current series of tax records. We hope that the information uh, we've provided today uh, and in all of our uh, podcasts is uh, useful and of course, as always, uh, everybody is welcome to uh, make contact with one of our happy and friendly tax team members uh, to discuss any questions. All of our details can be uh, easily found on our website, www.hallandwilcox.com.au, uh, or uh, you can connect with us on uh, LinkedIn. And uh, if you've enjoyed uh, today's episode, and hopefully you have, uh, please rate, review and follow our podcasts on whatever medium it is that you use to listen to podcasts. Mm -hmm.